postpartum physiology and assessment. So some of you have done your LMD or maybe done an LMD day or whatnot and maybe got to go up to postpartum. Have, has any of you guys done postpartum? Mm -hmm. A few of you? Okay. So um, the learning objectives, I'm not going to read each one of those individually. But So we'll start with talking about the postpartum period. The thing that I want you guys to remember is is everyone kind of thinks that like postpartum is just like the first six weeks after delivery. Um, but things take longer in some women. Everybody's different. And so we have what's kind of called the fourth trimester of pregnancy. Um, and that begins immediately after birth and can continue for six weeks or longer. So if you take anything away from this part right here is that I want you to remember that everyone kind of like lands on six weeks. But for some women, it takes longer for their bodies to kind of recover from pregnancy. Um, and so um, it takes their body longer to decrease the amount of estrogen that they're producing um, and things like that. And then you also take into consideration whether they're breastfeeding versus not breastfeeding. And so all of those things kind of play in, into their bodies kind of returning back to normal. Um, so that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about postpartum. So when you're up in mother baby, if any of you guys get a chance to, to experience mother baby this semester, I know only a few will get to, but oops. Um, these are kind of the things you focus on. So obviously you wanna prevent safety in any nursing area. Safety is huge. But promoting healing, um, facilitating family adjustment, that is a huge one. And that one doesn't just involve the mom. And sometimes I think that as nurses, we kind of get so focused on the patients and in this situation, the patient is the mom and the baby. But we also need to remember they have a partner and their partner is involved in, um, in an ideal world, they're involved in everything. So we need to make sure that we're involving them in um, any teaching that we're doing, any infant cares that we're teaching them how to do, or um, you know, sometimes I think we get so focused and we go in the room and say, hey mom, do you wanna change the diaper before you, you know, feed them? Um, but involve the dad or the um, partner or whoever is their support person that's gonna help them raise this child. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things that we forget about is, is the partner involvement. And sometimes that can be detrimental. So um, know your risk factors. So know your patient's history. I mean, that's with any, any area of nursing that you work in. Before you walk in that room, you, you wanna kind of look at their chart and kind of get a good report from the previous nurse so that you know what you're walking into. Um, and not, you know, walking into something that you have no idea is, is occurring, I guess is the best way to put that. Um, again, we've kind of talked about document in real time. Be consistent. So your sources of data, obviously your assessments, your prenatal records, the L&D records. So that kind of tells you, does the L&D records are important because when you're on postpartum, did the mom... Um, deliver vaginally? Did she have a C-section? What kind of incision should you be looking for? Did she have an episiotomy? Did she tear um, and has um, sutures that you need to be looking at? So that L&D record is going to be really important for you when you're assessing that patient um, in postpartum. Okay, so when we talk about assessment, it's kind of like a, um, like a surgical patient. So this person that has just delivered Initially, um, they're in, gonna be re assessing this mom every 15 minutes for the first hour. So it's kind of like a, a surgical patient. And then from there, as long as everything remains stable, then you'll go to 30 minutes for the second hour. So every 30 minutes. And then from there, every four hours. And typically the way Methodist kind of does things is you continue doing every four hours um, the remainder of their hospital stay. I know this says 12 to 24 hours, but um, while they're in the hospital, you're checking the baby every four hours. So you're typically going to be in there anyway. So you'll check the mom too. Um, and make sure that she doesn't have, you know, heavy bleeding and things like that. So um, just kind of an idea. And again, if there's complications, obviously, then that changes everything. Because then you'll be assessing more frequently. Okay, this right here. You should know this. And when I say you should know this, I mean, I promise you, this will be on the test. So for those of you who've either been on labor and delivery, postpartum, or have done your OB sim, I know that Erica kind of talks about, and during the OB sim, she talks about bubble her vein. Um, and so basically what this is, is this is your assessment. This is what you're looking at when you go in and assess this postpartum mom. So you're gonna check her breasts, you're gonna check her uterus, her bladder, her bowel, 
you're gonna look at her lochia, see how much she has. So for those of you who don't know what lochia is, that's her discharge after delivery. Um, incisions, so did she have a C-section? Does she have an incision? Um, if she had a vaginal delivery, did they do an episiotomy or did she tear and have stitches? Um, Holman sign, does anybody know what Holman sign is? For blood clots, yep, so you're checking the Holmans. Um, emotions, obviously that's a big one. Emotions are all over the place for anyone who's had a baby. We all know what that feels like. Um, making sure that they're resting, they're comfortable, but also making sure that they're getting enough activity. You don't want someone who just delivered a baby to be just laying in bed. You want them up, you want them moving, as long as their epidural has worn off and things like that. Vital signs, obviously. Um, how are they bonding with the baby? Do, do they even care that they just had a baby? Like, where, where are they at with that? Um, that's something you should constantly be watching is, is their bonding with, with that child. Um, and then their nutrition, making sure that once they have delivered and they've gotten the okay to eat, that they are eating. Um, because especially if they're breastfeeding, they need to be eating. And then education, that's always part of every patient that we take care of. So remember this, remember what the acronym stands for, and then just know that this is your assessment. Know like when, we, when I say bubble her vein, what are you gonna do? Just, it's gonna be on the test, I promise you. Um, okay, so then we kind of go into different systems. Um, I will talk about some of the systems and kind of what I, I kind of want you guys to know. I don't expect you to know every single change that's gonna occur. It, it's impossible to know that right now. So especially with as quick as we go through things. So when we talk about endocrine, um, what I want you to know is, is that there's lower blood glu glucose levels immediately postpartum. It, it happens in, in every woman. So what, what results, when you have lower blood glucose levels, what's gonna happen with the body? Shaking. What? Shaking. Um, not, not low blood, like I'm not saying they're gonna have low blood sugars, but when your level, your glucose level's lower, low what energy. else is, what? Low energy. Um, no, what I'm looking for is if you have lower blood glucose levels, your body is gonna produce less insulin mm -hmm. because you're not exposing yourself to those higher blood sugars. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of that, like it says here, that reverse dia, diabetic effects of the pregnancy. Um, it's just, it happens in all women. And, and some women might bottom out and experience those things that you guys are talking about. Um, but when I say lower blood sugars, it doesn't necessarily mean critically low. It just means lower than they were experiencing while they were carrying the baby. Yep. Um, okay, prolactin levels. What does, what does prolactin do in, in a woman who's just delivered? Yep, it helps with their breastfeeding and breast milk production. So you're gonna see these levels increase once they've delivered. Um, and then, you know, the, that second thing says levels return to pre-pregnancy state by three weeks in a woman who's not breastfeeding. Um, so that is a, a situation where like, again, everyone kind of focuses on that six week part, but in this situation, prolactin, if you're not breastfeeding, it takes your body about three weeks to kind of regulate. Um, if you are breastfeeding, obviously you're going to have higher prolactin levels for the, the interim, the, the whole time you're breastfeeding. Um, the one thing I want to say about breastfeeding is it says, you know, prolactin is responsible for suppression of ovulation and menstruation in breastfeeding women. And that is where a lot of women get this misconception that if I'm breastfeeding, then I'm on birth control and I cannot get pregnant. How true is that? No, no. It is not true. Breastfeeding is not a form of birth control. So just know that um, and when you're educating your patients, um, they, if they say, well, I'm gonna be exclusively breastfeeding so I don't need to get on birth control, that is very, very false. And they, when they are cleared to have intercourse again, will have a baby very, very quickly again. Um, so just remember, just because they're breastfeeding does not mean they can't get pregnant again. Big misconception. <clears throat> Um, okay, so your weight and immunologic changes. So when you're pregnant, you're immunocompromised. It's just part of pregnancy. Um, and that um, can be a, a flare up for autoimmune disorders postpartum. So we always kind of remind women who have things like lupus and things like that, that it, it's not abnormal to see a flare up post delivery. Uh, it doesn't happen to everybody. Um, it, you know, it just is, is something that can happen. When you talk about weight, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna ask you questions about oh well what's your initial weight loss because again we say 10 to 12 pounds, 
but that's different in every woman. I mean, my pregnancy, I gained 12 pounds the whole pregnancy. So when I had my son, then things, you know, I didn't lose 12 pounds immediately. Um, and so, you know, you have to think about, you lose some weight immediately, obviously you're delivering a baby. Um, you're losing some fluids when you deliver. And then you also have to take into consideration that postpartum diuresis that occurs, um, which then you lose more pounds. Again, we say five pounds, it could be more, it could be less. So I'm not gonna ask you questions specific to weight. Um, I might ask, you know, total weight loss occurs by six to eight weeks postpartum, but I'm not gonna say how many pounds are they gonna lose by six to eight weeks. So just so you guys know. Um, okay, so some, when you look at postpartum vital signs, they may have a temperature increase um, within the first 24 hours. It doesn't mean that they're um, developing an infection. What, what could cause that temperature increase? <clears throat> Anyone have any clues? It's related to the, the fluid shift. And so when you see up to 100.4, you see a woman with 102 fever postpartum, that's different. Then we're gonna be a little bit more concerned. But if I have a mom that's you know got a temp of 100 and she's less than 24 hours postpartum, I'm not gonna be uber concerned. Am I gonna watch it? Of course, I'm gonna monitor, but I'm not gonna be super concerned unless I start seeing 101, 102, 103. Then I'm like, oh, we got some problems. Um, this should go away after 24 hours, just so you guys know. So if you're on postpartum and you're taking care of a mom who's two days post delivery and she's got a temp of 101, we should be concerned. Um, your pulse, um, we all know with pregnancy, you have increased cardiac output. You're carrying a baby, you're growing a baby. So um, your cardiac output will eventually decrease. It slowly decreases over the first 48 hours. But um, again, everyone is different. So it takes a little bit of time. Uh, respirations, they're, their respirations return to normal because they can actually breathe again. They don't have a baby that's like pushing up on their lungs and their diaphragm. Um, and so they might be breathing a little bit differently than they were when they were pregnant. Not abnormal. Blood pressure. So this is different for everyone. If you have a mom that had a problem with pressures during pregnancy and she was, you know, diagnosed with preeclampsia or things like that, um, you're gonna be looking where it says pre-pregnancy levels weeks to months. You're gonna be looking more on that longer term. Um, and some moms require blood pressure meds for several months postpartum, especially if they were preeclamptic during pregnancy. If it was someone like me who had just some higher pressures towards the end of my pregnancy, they induced me, I had the baby, within two weeks my pressures were returned to normal. But I never had preeclampsia. So it just kind of, you kind of have to just critically think and think, well, if they had problems, Severely, it's gonna take their body longer to return to normal. So that's kind of the same thing. Um, again, we talked about temperatures. After 24 hours, mm -hmm. we would be concerned. Pulse, um, if they're tachycardic, it could be related to pain. Um, bradycardic, that could be related to if they had a spinal, if they had a C-section, or if they had an epidural. Um, respirations, tachypnea, again, that can be infection, or it could just be anxiety. I mean, becoming a mom is kind of a scary thing sometimes, so. Um, and then kind of blood pressures. If they had um, chronic blood pressure problems, they're gonna have blood pressure problems postpartum for a while, so. Okay, infections. We all know what infections can do to the body, so having a baby is not any different. So we just have to monitor moms for, babe, or for infections. Um, it says they can occur anytime between childbirth and up to six weeks postpartum. If you have an incision, it could, it could be longer than six weeks. So you just have to kind of make sure that when you're assessing patients that you're assessing their incisions and make sure that things are healing appropriately. Um, again, we talked about the short-term increase in temperature. It's a result of them, the fluid shift. So um, what would you be looking for if a mom had an episiotomy and had um, sutures? and you suspected infection, what might you see? Redness. Mm -hmm. Redness, um, kind of like, because they're gonna have lochia that they have, but it would be more of like a, kind of like a foul smelling. Um, and it might be, it might be bloody. It might, it just, the color can vary. 
But if you have an incision that looks red and angry and um, has a little bit of discharge from it, we need to be concerned. So, wouldn't the increase in temperature also be related to like uh, post labor, uh, like localized inflammation, and just mm -hmm. like and this and just the stress, like. I mean, I have an immune deficiency disorder, so I'm different, but like I got a fever postpartum because of just the stress that my body was under. Um, there were no signs of infection other than I had this fever, but you are correct. There's a lot of inflammation and a lot of, your body's just like, what the hell did I just go through? You know? And so um, sometimes that's the first thing that happens is you just get a little bit of a low grade fever. And then once it disappears mm -hmm. after 24 hours, then we know, okay, this isn't related to infection. This was just like a stress response. So, okay. I love this picture. Um, truly, everybody knows hand hygiene. It's, it's the number one prevention for infection. Hand hygiene and gloves when you are doing inspections of incisions. You don't want to just get in there with your hands and no gloves and you haven't washed them since you had lunch. Uh, you just, hand hygiene, it's important. Okay, so again, when we talk about infection, when you're, when you're doing bubble hervein and you're inspecting the breasts, if you notice any sort of open sore or cracking, that's something that we need to pay attention to because that can lead to mastitis, which can be a big problem in moms. Um, effective hand washing of the staff, but not just the staff, also the mom. Um, complete bladder emptying. If they're having problems with bladder emptying, that can obviously lead to what? Mm -hmm. bladder infections and UTIs yep so if they're having problems with that um, they may need a, a catheter put back in for a while so we just have to kind of keep an eye on things uh, <clears throat> assessing for breastfeeding you want to make sure they're doing proper proper technique because anytime you pull a baby off from their latch if you just pull them off without helping them release which we'll talk about during the feeding lecture um, it can cause trauma to the nipple, which can then lead to cracking and bleeding and bigger problems. So to proper technique is important. So always involve your um, lactation consultants. Okay, pain. I mean, obviously having a baby is painful. We expect that. Um, and so it would be abnormal to have a mom say she's not experiencing pain. I, I have never seen a mom say, I'm great. <laughs> um, but what's important is, are they able to tolerate the pain that they're in? So we need to know their intensity, the quality, the location. Um, duration just with as with any patient um, and obviously we want to shoot for non-pharmacologic things first so one of the big things that um, as a NICU nurse I didn't really pay attention to because I was a NICU nurse but when I started doing clinicals up on mother baby I learned about um, the ice packs that they give moms especially moms who've had episiotomies and they legit just take a diaper and they like shove the ice up in there and then give them the diaper and then they kind of just put that in their crotch area. Um, I had a C-section, so they kind of just laid like an ice pack over my incision. So um, I would have never thought to put an ice pack in my crotch having had a baby. Like I would never think to do that because I just didn't know. But um, that's a huge pharmacologic thing, non-pharmacologic thing that we can do for moms and it can avoid them maybe having to take pain meds. Um, and it's, it's enough for them. Other moms are very adamant that they want their meds every, you know, eight hours or every four hours that they can have them. So when we talk about pharmacologic, um, we'll go back here. Typically what you'll see like postpartum is going to be like 800 milligrams of Motrin and they can have that like every eight hours. And then most of the time you'll see like a, a, a narcotic like Norco which is gonna be like a hydrocodone with Tylenol. So the, the one thing that you always have to remember is, is sometimes even doctors will order just straight Tylenol. So you have to know how much Tylenol that patient has had. So if they're taking Norco and then they ask for like more Tylenol, you need to make sure that they're not being overdosed on Tylenol. So just always kind of pay attention to that. Yeah. I know um, you should pay attention, but also when I was there uh -huh. on mother reading, they, like the computer would, really track and like pop up how many they've had mm -hmm. and like the next time they can have a certain amount so I thought that was like kind of a nice yeah, it is very nice because sometimes <laughs> what will happen is you're you're coming on as like the night nurse and you're giving them like one Norco, but all day long they were getting two Norcos. Mm -hmm. And so then that changes how much they can get for you on the night shift because they've they're approaching their max of Tylenol, if that makes sense. So, so yes, it's important for you to keep track, but it's nice that the system kind of pops up 
for that too. What about too. the like the tactical anesthetics? Because I used to have to be the guy that would spray everything with hurricane spray and then put the ice packs and everything. On. Yeah, they don't. I don't really see them utilize those. They, the, I mean, that would be an option, I suppose. Um, but it's not like kind of part of the standing order set. Yeah, it's so topical. We did the dermal class. That was another video. Did you? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have. I personally have never seen them use that, but that doesn't mean that they don't. Um, but yes, that would be something that would be less invasive than taking a narcotic. And like you said, maybe putting that on and then giving them the ice pack and that's enough for them. So, um, okay, so neurologic. Um, headaches are most common postpartum neurologic symptom. Again, you talk about a big fluid shift that's gonna cause a headache. Um, when we talk about leakage of spinal fluid, what would that be from? Yep, so an epidural or a spinal if the mom had a spinal for a C-section. Uh, yes, so there, there's no mention of that really in this lecture, but one of the biggest treatments for um, a spinal headache that is really severe is a blood patch um, where they kind of take their own blood and um, kind of go in and patch it, so to speak, like patch the leak. Um, and I've heard, I've seen moms that have gotten those um, and they were like night and day different after the procedure. Like they said it was the best thing that could have happened to them because they were so miserable. So um, I don't see that often, but it does happen. So for some odd reason when the CSF, when, when they put their blood on the CSF, it gets really sticky. And then it, and then it just kind of closes fine. that hole up. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that causes headaches, hypertension. How many po postpartum moms or pregnant moms have hypertension? A lot of them. Um, fluid and electrolyte balances, again, from the fluid shift. And then just simply the stress of becoming a mom and a new role and a new, you know, job and lack of sleep. You may have labored for a long time and then the baby doesn't want to sleep because they think they're hungry all the time. And so you're up and you're tired. And so all of these things can lead to headaches. Um, so there might be some decreased attention or concentration or decreased memory Initially, obviously, that typically returns. I always kind of call it the mom brain. I don't think it ever comes back. It doesn't fully come back. <laughs> but there are things that you're just like, that was one thing that I said when I, you know, was postpartum, like a year postpartum. I was like, no one told me that mom brain was permanent. <laughs> um, and some of it is. And you're just like, I, I don't know. I don't know what my problem is. It's just mom brain. Um, but this right here, education um, needs lots of reinforcement. Who else should we be involved in? their partner, whoever their partner is. And the reason for that is, is because you might be teaching mom all of these things and she might not be retaining a damn thing that you're teaching her. And so you need to know that someone is retaining this information so that when you're sending this baby home, that they're gonna be safe. So always involve the partner. Um, okay, when we talk about neurologic symptoms, hi. Um, Level of consciousness, headaches, dizziness, all of these things are things you assess a normal patient for when they say they have a headache. You want to make sure that all of these things are not, you know, either they're happening or they're not, and we're addressing them if they are happening. Um, the one thing that um, you want to educate your patient for when they go home is, is that if they are having bad headaches with vision changes or their partner notices that they're having some confusion or things like that, they need to immediately call 911. Of course, seizure would be like worst case scenario, and that would be related to like a super high blood pressure that might cause them to have a seizure. Um, obviously, if we're at that point, you should be calling 911. So um, just educating your patients. Spinal headaches, okay, I guess I, I didn't realize I talked about the blood patch, but this is what this is. So we kind of talked about it, and the best way to describe it is just how he described it. For some reason, when they, they take their own blood, and mix it with the, that spinal fluid where that leak is, it, it just becomes sticky and it just kind of closes that hole, so to speak, so there's no more leaking. That's like a generic way of describing it. If you wanna look at it, it creates a blood clot to patch the dermata, but I like how Jared explained it. It just makes it kind of sticky and then it closes it up. So, um, so that's kind of how we treat spinal headaches. Okay, so cardiovascular, the next system we talked about. Cardiovascular system, your, um, your blood volume increases due to pregnancy. Returns to pre-pregnancy state six to 12 weeks postpartum. Again, give or take. Um, so auto transfusion, 
This occurs immediately after birth where like five to 750 mils of blood is diverted from the placenta back to the maternal system because that cord has been cut. So the baby no longer needs that blood. Um, and then you have an increase in like their stroke volume and that thing. Um, it initially pe or increases, but then slowly declines. Um, and cardiac output can be pre-pregnancy by two to three weeks. I feel like that's a little bit quick. Um, it takes a little bit longer, I feel like, than two to three weeks. So um, just know that it, you know, it's, I would say probably more like two to six weeks for it to be post, you know, to be truly what it was prior to the mom being pregnant. But it's amazing that after birth, 80% above pre-labor value, that's a huge increase in your cardiac output. Okay, your decrease in blood volume. So what we consider, these numbers I want you to know. When you're talking about a normal, healthy delivery um, that does not include um, a postpartum hemorrhage, a vaginal delivery is typically about three to 500 mils of blood loss. You start getting up into the six, seven, 800 mark for a vaginal delivery, you're thinking postpartum hemorrhage. Now with a C-section, obviously we're talking about an open abdominal surgery, so they're gonna lose more blood. So 500 to 1,000 mils is considered normal blood loss for a vaginal. You get more than that, you're gonna start thinking postpartum hemorrhage. So those two numbers I would, I would know. Just the numbers there or the hemorrhage? Uh, just these numbers, because if it's, if it's above 500 for a vaginal delivery, you're immediately gonna think hemorrhage. And if it's above a thousand, you're immediately gonna think hemorrhage. So um, I, I don't even care if you know the lower numbers, just know that like that high number mark, where if I say to you, you know, in a test question, I have a woman who delivered vaginally, her uterus is boggy and she has lost 900 mils of blood. What are you thinking? Hemorrhage. That you know, okay, well we're thinking maybe she's hemorrhaging, you know, um, okay. You don't need to know a thousand mils of blood loss and diuresis. I don't, you don't need to know the, the mixture of fluid and blood loss. Like I want you to focus on what is considered normal and what would lead you to believe she's having a hemorrhage. Okay. So when you talk about lab changes, the hematocrit is decreased for three to four days postpartum, but it's delayed. So if you had a mom that lost, you know, a thousand mils of blood, in a vaginal delivery and you check a hemorrhoid or a hematocrit two hours after delivery, it's not going to show, it's not going to be indicative of that blood loss. It takes time for that to kind of lower and then it will take time for it to come back up. So just know that those lab values are a little bit delayed. Um, same with platelet <coughs> counts and those kinds of things. <clears throat> okay. Cardiac. Again, what do you assess for in a patient when you're looking for cardiac? You're gonna check their perfusion. What is their blood pressure? Um, how is their cap refill? Are they having chest pain? Are they having heart palpitations? Are they having neck vein distension, um, arrhythmias? None of these things should be occurring during postpartum. They, I mean, you shouldn't see a mom that has neck vein distension. So if you do, we have problems. So um, that would be something you'd wanna to report to your nurse right away. Um, Edema, that one's kind of a hard one because I feel like, you know, you have a mom that's 40 weeks pregnant, she's swollen everywhere. And so until she diuresis, she's going to have a little bit of edema still postpartum. So, um, again, just know your patient. Do they have a history of cardiac disease? Do they have, um, educate them if they're having heart palpitations or like a racing heart? Um, swelling in the face or their hands or their feet especially that wasn't there before or chest pain, or difficulty breathing, call 911. Common sense stuff. Um, okay, so delivery causes an immediate decrease in intra-abdominal pressure, which means what? They can breathe again. So um, they don't have that babe that's pushing up on their ribs and kicking them and all those things that make it much harder to breathe. Um, so oxygen debt from pregnancy extending into the um, postpartum period. Um, I don't really see that very often. Um, and when they say oxygen debt, it's like the, can I catch my breath and all that. They typically, once they have had the baby, they have room to breathe again and everything is, is good. 
Um, so again, respiratory assessment, you always listen to their lungs, monitor their oxygen saturations. Um, that's not something we do in postpartum. Like they're not on monitors in postpartum. If you suspect there's a problem, I would check saturations for sure. Um, and observe for shallow breathing, labor breathing, restlessness. What could those be signs of? What? Or PEs, yeah, yeah. Shallow breathing, um, labored breathing, restlessness, especially that restlessness, something's going on. Um, again, educate your patient. If they're having difficulty breathing, um, a new productive dry cough, something that just doesn't feel right to them, any sort of chest pain, you wanna call, you wanna call 911. I feel like those, I don't know why I put those slides in there because I just feel like they're common sense, but. Okay, so breasts, when we talk about what we're looking for. Um, initially, there's little to no change to the breast post the first 24 hours postpartum. Um, they have a little bit of colostrum coming out, um, but usually about three to four days is when um, a mom's milk really starts to kind of come in, and you see that transition from colostrum, which is that really thick, really nutrient-rich milk, so to speak, that they're getting, um, to actually like breast milk. And so, um, when that occurs, their breasts become fuller, heavier. They might be a little bit warm or firm to the touch initially until they can get that baby to really start emptying that breast or if they're pumping, um, making sure that they're emptying completely. Um, some, some might have like lumps or nodules. Um, those are just the milk ducts that are full. It's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh my gosh, we need to assess why there's a lump here. Um, so for moms who aren't breastfeeding, there, I know a long, long time ago, there used to be like medications that they would give moms to kind of help dry up that milk supply. Um, that's not something that's really done anymore. And so unfortunately for these moms, they still kind of go through that engorgement of that three to four day postpartum where that milk is in. And because they're not emptying, because they're not putting babe to breast or they're not pumping, um, it's really painful. Um, there's an old wives tale that says cabbage leaves help <coughs> dry up the milk ducts, like literally just putting cabbage leaves in the bra and I don't know if it works. That's just like an old wives tale, but, um, you, would you say? I disagree. Like, I didn't think it helped me. Did you try the cabbage leaves? Mm -hmm. I did too. Because I, I would pump for like an hour and get less than half an ounce. Like it was terrible. Okay. And so I got mastitis both times. Right. With my kids. Right. So the, the way that breastfeeding works, again, for those of you who haven't had babies, whatever, your body is gonna produce whatever you tell it to produce in most cases. Some women, they have lower prolactin levels, so maybe they aren't able to breastfeed as effectively. In your case, like you were saying, I was pumping, getting a half an ounce, so what's the point? Yeah. Um, but if you, if you have a baby that's breastfeeding and they, they breastfeed and they take two to three ounces, your body is gonna say, I need to keep producing this milk because this it's emptying. Whereas when a mom is not breastfeeding, the body is still producing that milk until it figures out that like, oh gosh, it's not emptying, no one's taking this milk. And then it will eventually stop. It says resolves in 24 to 36 hours. I beg to differ on that. Um, as a mom who breastfed for 11 months and then decided, okay, I'm done because my supply dropped. Um, it was not 24 to 36 hours before my milk decided to stop being produced. Again, I breastfed for 11 months, so maybe that's part of it, but um, it took a week before I was finally like, okay, I am no longer, like I'm done producing milk. So how long did it, you said you tried the cabbage leaves, how long, yeah. did, how long did it take you? I don't know, it was a few days. Yeah. Like I had a fever, like it was else? bad. That's, <laughs> yeah, it, mastitis makes it worse. Yeah. So for, again, for those who don't know what mastitis is, it's an infection of the milk ducts. Um, and I luckily never had it, but for moms who do get it, we'll kind of talk about it, but it's, um, you almost feel like you have the flu because you get kind of like a high fever. You kind of get like, a lot of women get body aches kind mm -hmm. of all over. And then obviously it's painful in whichever breast you have the mastitis in. Um, so this kind of shows you I don't expect you to know all of the ducks and names of those. It's, this is just a picture so you guys kind of get an idea. I'm not gonna ask you those. That would just be mean, because I don't even know all of them. So, um, okay, so we talk about shape, size, um, engorgement. 
what that means is the milk is coming in. So you're gonna, the, they're gonna feel a lot of firmness. Um, sometimes it can be warm and it's gonna be pretty sore to the touch, especially if you're not emptying. Um, again, we talked about assessing the nipples for redness, bruising, cracks, and things like that. Cause if there is redness or cracks, there could be bleeding and we need to make sure that we don't cause an infection. Um, we kind of already talked about this. Engorgement's usually about three to four days. That's kind of what you guys need to know. Um, okay, so comfort measures, warm compresses or shower before breastfeeding, cold compresses applied, applied to the breast after feeding. Um, the one thing that I have found in my practice is um, if a mom is having a lot of pain when they're breastfeeding, it's it's helpful if they kind of massage that those milk ducts while they're breastfeeding to kind of force that milk out. So that's what they're kind of talking about as um, breast massage and milk expression. Obviously NSAIDs. And then they do offer these glycerin pads that you can put in the fridge that are wonderful in case anyone ever breastfeeds. Um, Non-breastfeeding moms, they're gonna be uncomfortable. It, it There's no way around it. Um, but lactation suppression medications, they are not used in the US. So if anyone asks you about them, it's not an option here. They use them in other countries, but not here. Um, supportive bras are important when you are breastfeeding or when you are trying to be done breastfeeding. So again, I feel like we've talked about this. Flu-like symptoms, we just kind of talked. Um, aches, chills, typically most moms end up with a high fever um, and that's gonna be mastitis. Can you breastfeed with mastitis? Anybody know? They tell you to. You can. And it's, it's actually beneficial um, for you to do so because it kind of gets that milk out. The, the caveat to that is if you have a mom that has mastitis and she's also got like on her nipples, she's got cracks and, and maybe some bleeding that potentially yeast could be there, then we don't breastfeed. If a mom has yeast on her breast in any way, shape or form, um, you put a babe to breast, they're going to get yeast and they're going to have thrush in their mouth because they have been exposed to yeast. So that would be the one time you would not breastfeed is if you have a yeast infection going on. So, um, okay. So bowel and urinary elimination, who's at greatest risk? Children, older adults, and pregnant women. Why is that for pregnant women? Or postpartum women? What's one big thing that they all do? Well, one, they give birth and so then they're scared to poop because they have an episiotomy or whatever. But what's what what do they what do they all take? Narcotics. What do narcotics do? Yeah. So it's kind of a catch twenty two because that first bowel movement after pregnancy, especially if you've had a vaginal delivery, you're you're very sore. And I can't say that I've ever experienced that because I had a C section. Um, but um, I can only imagine, especially if you have an episiotomy, especially when we talk about those, like you get to like a fourth degree tear. Um, I can imagine the fear of not wanting to poop. And then you throw narcotics in the mix, which kind of stop you up. And if you're not drinking enough and all of those things, it creates bigger issues. So, um, Okay, so decreased gastrointestinal muscle tone and motility. Why is that? What? Well, yep, and so if you had a C-section because you have, they cut right through your abdominal muscles. But even with a vaginal delivery, um, their muscles have stretched so much to, to make room for that baby that, yeah, those muscles are a little bit weak. And, um, yeah, so that can affect a lot of things as well. Um, bowel movements, they usually resume normal about two to three days postpartum when tone is kind of regained. And again, that also depends on the amount of narcotics and fluids that the person has taken in. Um, hopefully it's a good ratio and <laughs> not too much narcotics, not enough fluids. Um, I, I don't know why. Risk of anal incontinence, I think, would be more of a, if they had some severe trauma during delivery. Um, okay, so palpate the abdomen, listen for bowel sounds. The most important question that you can ask somebody who just had a baby vaginally or c-section is are you passing gas because we need to know we need to know if they're um at that point that 
Because if not, we've got problems. If they're three days postpartum and they're not passing any gas, they're not even remotely close to having a bowel movement, how can we send them home? So definitely don't be afraid to ask that question. Again, we talked about adequate fluid intake. Um, don't avoid the urge to go because, again, moms are scared because they've had trauma down there. Um, hemorrhoids. You guys did your um, med cards. What did you do with those? What was one of the treatments for hemorrhoids? Yes, the tux or witch hazel um, pads. Um, I hear refrigerating them also makes them that much better and that much more relieving. I'm not. What'd you say? I said go lance and dig out the clot. Well, that sounds traumatizing, but sure. <laughs> um, for anyone who didn't hear what he said, did you guys hear what he said? No. Lance it and dig out the clot, and then they go away. So that's, 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 that's a little trauma. I mean, I'll I'll let you take care of that one, Jared. <laughs> um, okay, so this is important. Obviously, when you're educating your patient, if they don't have a bowel movement within five to seven days after delivery, we've got a problem. And if they're already home at that point, um, they need to be calling. Um, nausea, vomiting, interventions. Um, I don't, I mean, I see women vomit because of like the big fluid shift. Um, I see women vomit because they get a spinal and their blood pressures tank. I've never really seen a woman that's like a ton of nausea and vomiting postpartum, like we're talking like 24 hours later. Um, but I suppose it happens. Um, so the chewing gum thing is um, mint. Mint helps with nausea. So that's what that's about, if you're wondering. Um, avoid gaseous foods like beans and broccoli. Heat therapy. Rocking in a rocking chair because it moves things. I don't... Okay. So urinary. Why, why are they at increased risk for infection postpartum? Yep, and what else? It's a C-section, but they have, they have a catheter, so it's an ACE or it's an EGI, so mm -hmm. catheter. So the other thing that they're at risk for infection for is because if they have had a tear or an episiotomy, there's trauma. I mean, you have an incision that's not supposed to be there or a tear that's not normally there. Bugs tend to go towards those things, so. I imagine the hygiene's not the greatest. Well, yeah, and you got Lokia coming out, so that's why it's important to teach good hygiene and all those fun things. Um, increased risk of stress incontinence. You always talk about, you hear women say, now when I sneeze, I pee a little because I've had four babies. It happens. It, it's just part of, part of the wonderful things that we get to experience as women because we've had children, so... Um, postpartum diuresis, again, we've kind of talked about this. It takes, uh, I mean, it's, it's different for every woman. So I'm not going to ask you time frames. Um, bladder distension. Again, we talked about urinary, um, retention. Um, the catheter that Allison mentioned, she could get at risk for infection for having a catheter. Nursing care, again, removing the indwelling catheter. Um, keeping track of their first few voids, making sure they're drinking lots of water. Educate. I mean, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Most women know the signs and symptoms of UTIs, so. Okay, so when you're talking about their uterus, um, has anyone been postpartum and got to assess a uterus? Tell us about it. First two hours. Did you do it? Uh, like the fungal yeah. massage? Yeah. So what's what's... What's important? What do you have to do? How do you do it? Um, well, I, I felt like I was digging into her belly button. Like kind you of you are. Yeah, you you, like, I mean, you got to push down. Yes, yeah, so you have to like support from the bottom and then just pretty much massage to, um, and then check just to make sure it's midline and mm -hmm. it doesn't deviate. And when you're massaging, what are you checking for? Uh, firmness. The firmness. firmness. Yep. Yeah. Okay, the key that I you said, like what'd you do with your other hand? Mm -hmm. uh, support the from the bottom. Why do you do that? Because if you don't support it, and in some women, it could come right out their vagina. So supporting it, because you're pushing, you're pushing pretty good for anyone who's done an assessment. It looked minor, like, so like, like a it looked purple. And then like, basically, like, 
Mm -hmm. It's not, I mean, for anyone who's experienced it, who's, I mean, who are moms here, like, it's not fun. It does not feel good, especially when that's the area that hurts you the most. But, yeah, when you have a C-section, it's terrible because your incision's right there. And they're pressing so hard and all you want to do is yell at them. It, well, it's every 30 minutes. Yeah. So it's not fun. Let's just put it that way. But always remember, your one hand needs to support the bottom of that uterus because we don't want to. We don't want to have a uterus on the bed. So. so remember support. Do we have to remember every thirty minutes? No. I mean. You just do it more frequently right after. Mm -hmm. and then it gets it's usually Yeah, and on this part where it talks about the involution, which is where it's like returning to its normal state, I'm not going to ask you that it, how many like every six to twelve hours it it change, like it rises. I'm not going to ask you that stuff. What I might ask you is positioning of your hands and things like that. Um, the other thing too with contractions, it talks about oxytocin. So endogenous versus ex, I can never say that word. What's the difference between the two? One is external, the other is internal. So the, uh, the one I cannot pronounce <laughs> is us giving them oxytocin postpartum. What is the other one? Where is it coming from? Oh, natural after so what what might potentially cause that yep so putting a baby to breast is going to cause the uterus to have um some contractions and whatnot and that is related to the body's natural release of oxytocin because it's the body's trying we are helping it by giving it iv but the body is trying to promote hemostasis and so the body's going to do what it's supposed to do. So that they call them after pains, um, which you can see there. Um, and a lot of people experience them when they're breastfeeding initially, the first several, like first 24 to 48 hours. So um, this picture, again, like I said, I'm not going to ask you where it's going to be six to 12 hours postpartum, but this just kind of gives you an idea of where it starts and where it ends, if that makes sense. Um, okay. So. When you look at this, the one thing I want you to take from this slide is the last part, uterine atony. So it's lack of muscle tone, AKA a boggy uterus, which results in excessive uterine bleeding and fill, filling with blood and clots, okay? So if you have a boggy uterus, what's the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna massage. If you continue to have a boggy uterus, what are you going to look for? Bladder distension. Because if the bladder is distended, AKA they have uterine reten or urine retention, it's in the way of the uterus doing what it's supposed to do. It's pushing up on that uterus. So there's a, a an order of things, so to speak. So if you have a mom that's got a boggy uterus and you're uh, massaging and it's not fixing it, the next thing you're going to check is their bladder. Their bladder's not distended. Then what would you do? Then you would call the provider. Because if you call the provider after saying, oh, I have this body uterus. I've massaged it for five minutes. It's not changing. The first thing they're going to ask you is, how's their bladder? And if you say, I don't know, they're going to be real irritated with you. <laughs> so just remember that, that order. Check the uterus. Check if you got a body uterus and it's not massaging to, you know, turning firm with massage. Are they distended? Do they, do they have urine? Because you can feel if their bladder is distended. You'll be able to feel it. And you guys aren't going to be alone when you're doing this initially. So um, so common cause bladder distension. It's the leading cause of postpartum hemorrhage. Okay. Placental site. So after the delivery, the placental site should separate from the uterine wall. Um, it Your body should do it on its own. And... Um, it's usually within like, I think I have it on another slide here. So. Usually it, within like the first 15 to 30 minutes. It's like, excuse me, 95% of placentas detach from the uterine wall and the placenta is then delivered within 30 minutes on like 95% of deliveries. So that other 5%, we've got a problem and they're retaining that placenta or parts of that placenta, which then leads to postpartum hemorrhage because of the retained um, products of 
the placenta, so to speak. Um, an increase in bleeding may occur around seven to 14 days postpartum. I've, again, I feel like that's different with everybody. Um, some, some women are completely done bleeding by 14 days. So, so this is the lovely picture of what we were just talking about. Always have that hand supporting because we don't want to just push that uterus right on out. That would not be fun. There's a picture. So in this picture, you were saying how hard and how like it's more this shows you like this shows you how far she's pushing down and how you could <clears throat> understand how that, that might hurt really really bad especially if you just delivered. Yeah. Um, okay, again we talked about the uterus. Know your patient's um, baseline for pain. Pre medicate. So when you're doing an assessment, um, you know you're gonna do an assessment and their epidural has kind of worn off. It would be nice of you to offer them pain meds maybe before you do it. If they still have their epidural, then hopefully they don't feel it as much. Um, so obviously you're checking the uterus, but you're also looking at their lochia when, when you're doing that. Monitoring how much is coming out and that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, again, I'm not gonna ask you healing times for these. Um, and when the cervix completely returns to normal, I don't, I don't think that that helps you guys in any way, shape or form. It takes a little time again for the body to return to normal and hemorrhoids decrease in size unless you go with Jared's route and then they're immediately gone. <laughs> um, okay. So Ligia, it's the postpartum discharge that kind of removes any debris that's left from birth. Um, this is the best way to describe it. I know it sounds weird. But when you talk about, like you say, like a musty, um, it's, it's an inoffensive odor. It doesn't smell like someone who has something that is infected, if that makes any sense whatsoever. But there is a smell to it, as with any sort of body fluid. So don't be like, oh my gosh, this smells weird, because unless it's like truly infected, it's not an abnormal smell, if that makes sense. Um, amount and length um, of the lochia discharge, it varies with each person. There's usually an increased amount in the morning or after resting in bed. That's just common sense. You're laying down, you stand up, gravity takes effect. Um, it should be lighter in flow and color the further out you are from delivery. Um, these are the names that you've probably seen if you've been in LND so far. So rubra is what you're gonna see the first few days. It's basically blood. Um, there could be some small clots. Um, but there shouldn't be big clots. Um, then pinkish, kind of brownish, three to 10 days. And then ALBA is a white or yellow discharge um, and can last anywhere from four to eight weeks postpartum for some women. And then of course we have to have pictures because why not? Um, so when you talk about heavy, the, sorry, the scant is and heavy, obviously heavy is the last one. Um, I don't know, I don't know why it did that, but anyway, um, just like any, you know, a woman with their period, you always tell them if they're filling, if they're, if they're filling a pad an hour, we've got a problem. They probably need to be seen in the ER. Um, in, in this instance, obviously you just gave birth, there's trauma to the area. So what they consider heavy is if you're filling a pad with, within every 15 minutes. Again, I'm not going to ask you that time frame. That's just for your information. But this, this kind of gives you an idea of what you would see when you're doing a check. Would you still descri uh, describe that as like a serosanguinous? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one I would because it's not like a bright red blood. Yeah. Again, we kind of just talked about that. Okay. Saturating a pad in an hour or less, they need to, you know, notify their provider. If they're passing clots that are egg size or larger, that's an interesting size. Um, if they go from having like kind of that white yellowish discharge back to frank blood, they need to, they need to um, call. Um, again, foul smelling order. We're talking about an infection. Postpartum hemorrhage. What's the definition for a vaginal delivery? 500. 500 or more. What's the definition for a C-section? Yes. Postpartum hemorrhage is unpredictable and can occur even in the absence of risk factors. 
So basically, what is that saying? Anybody, Anybody is at equal risk for a postpartum hemorrhage. <laughs> These pictures are funny. I don't know. <laughs> I'm done. Just kidding. That seems like about right. Um, what's the leading cause of postpartum hemorrhage? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you talk about signs and symptoms, obvious signs, lots of blood, subtle signs, you have a slow constant trickle over an extended period of time. That can be a sign of things to come and can be a very ominous sign. Um, too much is saturating a peripad in an hour or less. And again, like I said, your H&H &H is not a, an indicative predictor because it takes time for that level to drop. Um, and so you just got to go with your gut. I mean, if there, if you see lots of blood, then we got problems. What vital signs would you see with excess blood loss? Mm -hmm. Low blood pressure. Low blood pressure. What's the other one you're going to see? High heart rate. High heart rate. What else? Decreased level. Probably increased respiration. Increased. Yeah. What? It, who said something over there, back there? Would you LOC. Say that again. I'm sorry. Decreased consciousness. Yes, and what Jared said, um, increased respirations. So pretty much you're gonna see lots of vital changes, but the first one that you'll probably see is gonna be like your decreased pressure and you're gonna be tachycardic. So that right there kind of sums it up. Changes, vital sign changes, they're a late sign of hemorrhage. Because at this point, if you're seeing a blood pressure drop, you've already noticed that they're hemorrhaging, so. <laughs> Sorry, I overreacted. <laughs> okay. You got to keep it light sometimes, guys. Um, okay. So the first cycle after delivery is terrible because you get so excited when you're breastfeeding that maybe you go three or four months without it or maybe sometimes longer. And then you get your period and you're like, gosh, darn it. Um, it can be heavier um, your first go round after delivery. Um, but again, every woman is different and every woman is different when they get their period back too. Some women breastfeed for 18 months and they don't have a period the whole time. Lucky them. But again, it depends on the person. So, so when we talk about inspecting, um, you have to include the perineum and the rectum because we're talking about lacerations, episiotomies. And hemorrhoids. I'm always going to turn back to Jared because of what he said. I, I can't. I just can't now. Hey, on how to get rid of them. When you're fully deployed, you got to do what you got to do and get them back it's out. True there. story. I mean, I don't. I don't have that experience, but I trust you. So when you're talking about an episiotomy, what what is an episiotomy? So it's when the doctor actually is like there and they see, okay, this mom's going to tear. So I'm going to cut to prevent the tear from maybe being worse. So they'll go in and kind of do that cut um, prior to the mom tearing. So approximately 10% of U.S. births. Um, I guess I should probably check on that. I'm not sure how how true that really is anymore. Well, that you're supposed to let them tear because it heals better. That's why you don't see very many episiotomies. Um, and so most of the time, yeah, if it's a natural tear. But some doctors, you know, it's easier to stitch a cut than it is a tear. So, yes. I was just going to say on Tuesday we saw one because it was a first time mom. Uh -huh. And she was pushing for so long, but she was having a hard time. She just had like one little like tight spot. Mm -hmm. So the doctor just snipped. Just a, a tiny, tiny little snip. Yep. Yeah. Just, I saw one on, on Tuesday too. And the doctor like, because she was, the patient was starting to tear like up. Uh -huh. And the doctor said, because that's a lot more painful. Yeah. So she started kind of like. Going down. down. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So, um. There are different degrees um, of lacerations that, and we'll kind of talk about all of them, but um, none of them sound pleasant. Let's just put it that way. When they do an episiotomy, do they, like, they would have to ask the mom and say, can we do this, or do they just kind of use their judgment? It's just part of, it's part of birth, and it's an understanding, I guess, if you will. They'll tell them. We're gonna we're gonna yeah, go ahead and yeah. Yeah, there's no like consent like, that's no. Saying, hey, you no. Yep. Yep. So this is do you have, are you just stretching your question? Yeah, sorry. 
I think most of them prefer to let the tear, but if it, if it's a matter of like in her instance where like it's maybe keeping that fade from coming out, they will do they'll do the episiotomy. But so this is kind of the pictures. Um, a first degree tear, second degree, third degree, fourth degree just looks absolutely horrible because it's all the way down and they do occur <laughs> don't look on your face no i'm just i'm just trying to figure out how they would stitch that back up yeah yeah so this situation right here is the one where the remember when we were talking about gi issues and risk of anal incontinence this this one right here could you know potentially cause some of that um and some of these bigger tears could potentially cause like some sexual dysfunction and things like that too. Um, and so obviously I've never seen a third or fourth degree. Most of the time it's first and second degrees or that or what you see. I've never seen it this bad. It, it occurs obviously, but I've just never seen it that way. I had the one case where the spouse asked for extra sutures and then I thought his wife was gonna kill him. Yeah. Okay, so this right here, you guys, you need to know. This acronym, the RITA, this is what you're going to use when you're inspecting incisions. So whether it's the C-section incision or the perineum, you're looking for redness, edema, echibosis, discharge, drainage, and approximation. How is, how is that incision healing or tear and, and their sutures? How is it healing? This will be on the test, I promise you. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. You guys have questions about that? Okay. I'm just going to start calling. Quiz time. All right, so we have a client that has lochia rubra is moderate and her fundus is boggy two centimeters above the umbilicus. Which of the following actions should the nurse take first? B, massage that uterus. Don't call the healthcare provider first. Okay. A G2, P2 postpartum six hours after vaginal delivery is assessed. The nurse notes that the fundus is firm. There's heavy lochia rubra and paraffinous sutures are intact. Which of the following actions should the nurse do? Nothing. You'd want to notify the provider because if her uterus is firm, she's not hemorrhaging because of her uterus, but she's having heavy lochia. So what could that be related to? She has peritoneal or per, perineal sutures that they say are intact, but she could be bleeding from that 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 wound. That's the tear or mm -hmm. yep. Uh, okay, C-section incisions. These are the different types. Um, Any more, you're typically going to see the low transverse incision. That is the the preferred incision. Um, if there's complications with scar tissue or the babe, um, you'll see a classical incision, but they have really gone away from that because of what the recovery is for the mom. It's a lot worse to have that classical incision. Um, but again, you want to use that Rita, assess that incision, um, make sure the incision is clean and dry. And then every doctor kind of, um, does their incisions, closes them differently. So you could have stitches, you could have glue with steri strips, you could have staples, or the newest thing is the this wound vac that, that's pictured there. Um, a lot of women will have those. I know that they put them on, like I had it because I have impaired healing due to my immune issues, but a lot of times on women who are a little bit obese, they will put these on because um, it helps support their incision a little bit better. Um, they are wonderful. That's all I have to say about that. Um, again, you're just gonna educate your patient if they have a laceration, episiotomy, or a C-section incision to look for the signs and symptoms of infection. And if they have them, call. Um, okay, we talked about the Homan sign on bubble her vein. So that's your lower extremities. Um, you're looking for edema. Is it unilateral or bilateral? 
is the circumference of their calves significantly different? Do they have a positive home inside? Again, we kind of talked about what that is. If it's positive, they could potentially have a, a blood clot. So there's kind of a picture. You can see in that picture, the circumference is different. There's redness. It's likely warm to the touch. It's probably painful. Um, that's a like a perfect picture of someone who's got a DET going on. Um, we do things in the hospital to prevent. Obviously, ambulation early and often is important. If they're stuck in bed, leg exercises are good. They use the anti-embolum stockings and they use the sequential devices on the C-section moms. Those are, are great things too. Um, avoid crossing your legs. Um, elevate your legs while sitting. Hydration. Um, we kind of talked about the abdominal muscles and how they just take a little time to kind of re return to normal. Um, hair loss. Hair loss is huge. Um, occurs for at least three months postpartum. For some months, it's even worse. And like, legit, they feel like they're losing all of their hair. It, it, again, it's different for every mom. So, um, the, the striate gravidium fade, so your stretch marks kind of fade. That's, you know, in the um, linea nigra, um, it's, it, in some women, it's very prominent during pregnancy. That typically fades postpartum as well. Um, neuromuscular. Okay, so we talk about sensation of lower extremities. Do they have an epidural? What, how long is it taking for them to get that back? Um, assisting with ambulation, you should always be present the first time your patient gets out of bed. They should never go to the bathroom for the first time by themselves. And I know that that sounds so strange, but um, as a mom who went to the bathroom for the first time and my nurse came in with me and I asked her what the hell she was doing, <laughs> um, never been more thankful that she was there. Because, you know, the first time you walk, you're lightheaded, you're maybe a little dizzy. Um, and again, gravity takes effect. So all of that lochia starts coming out and you can't bend over when you've had a C-section. So let your nurse come to the bathroom with you. Actually, I tried to put weight. I had an epidural, but I thought that I could like, mm -hmm. walk. Mm -hmm. um, and my nurse took me to the bathroom. I put weight on like I think it was my left leg. Didn't fully come back right away. Yeah. Um, and I almost fell. On my left side because I'm just telling you, and man. I'm laughing, and she's like worried. And you think it's like the most awkward thing in the entire world that another woman is going to the bathroom with you, but when you stand up and she, you know, you have again, I'm not trying to be graphic, but it this is reality, this is life, and you have blood running down your legs, and all you think about is, yeah. I just had a c section, how am I going to clean that up? And your nurse just jumps right in, doesn't say a word, you're like. I love you. Well, and they have to show you how to use that carry bottle thing. Which I didn't have to I do had no because I had a C-section. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so with vaginal deliveries, yeah. that's important Which too. I thought was weird. Um, <laughs> so um, also the first time you get them up, you want to be careful with orthostatic hypotension, hypotension. So sit them on the side of the bed, let them sit for a minute, then get them up. You know, don't just have them get up. Um, postpartum chills. Has any anyone seen a C-section yet? Has anyone seen the mom shivering like something fierce? Yeah. Totally normal. I don't know why it's, it, but it is. Is that section where they shiver? Yep. I mean, most of the time, I mean, I think that some vaginal deliveries do, but you notice it more in C-section moms, I think, because they're laying flat on the table. But I just remember my husband asking me if I, something was wrong with me because I was shivering so bad. And I was like, no, this is totally normal. And he's like, this is not normal. And I was like, except that it is. It's fine. <laughs> So, but I knew that, like, if I was a mom who didn't know that that was normal, I would have been a little bit worried, but it's a, it's a normal finding. Um, it's benign as long as you're, you don't have fever, but it occurs with a lot of them. Okay. So again, we talked about transition to the mother role. Um, most, most women make that seamlessly and some don't, but we'll talk about postpartum depression and psychosis in a later lecture. Um, factors that can affect the transition. The biggest one I feel like right now is that's on this list is admission to the NICU because we're taking that baby away from that mom. And that is probably one of the hardest things that you can do. You have a preterm baby and that mom comes downstairs and you have to tell her she can't hold her baby. Like that's the worst thing you can possibly say to a mom. But unfortunately in some situations you have to because the baby's just not stable. So that can really affect their bonding and whatnot. Um, 
again, we're just trying to promote positive. Rooming in is the most important thing. So when we take that baby away, we, we intervene and we interfere with that. So that is not fun, but again, it's necessary in a lot of cases. So, um, so again, it says non-separation of mothers and babies. Sometimes that's not always an option. So, um, energy and emotions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the emotional side because we have a whole lecture on postpartum depression. Um, but just notice those. And if you see something concerning, you need to let your nurse know because if you see it, somebody else is probably seeing it too, but maybe they're scared to say something. So if you notice that they're not bonding with the babe or that mom is just extremely emotional, um, just make sure someone's aware of it so that we can get her the support she needs. Um, again, I'm not gonna touch a bunch on this, but postpartum blues, there's postpartum blues, there's postpartum depression, there's postpartum psychosis. We will hit on all of that in, the, in another lecture, but just know that they exist and that we should be monitoring all moms for those. Um, positive attachments, touching, holding, gazing, talking to the baby, especially calling it by its name, saying, oh, you look so much like your dad or you look so much like your grandma or something, you know, that they're really engaging with that baby. Um, avoid heavy lifting, excessive stair climbing. Um, this is the big one, sexual activity. It says resume when perineum is healed and lochia has stopped. Um, some women take that as, well, I had a C-section, so I don't, I didn't have any trauma, so I can, I can have intercourse right away. Um, not true because you still have lochia and you still have your body trying to expel things from the pregnancy and introducing, um, semen into a uterus that has just delivered a baby is putting them at a huge risk for infection. So it's very important to make them understand that intercourse should not occur until the doctor has cleared them. Some people don't listen. Some people do what they want to do, but as long as you educate them at, at the problems that can occur, I mean, risk for hemorrhage is a big one too. If you don't wait, especially if you have, um, an episiotomy or an incision that isn't healed properly. Nutrition. I think that we all know um, that when you're breastfeeding, you should have an extra 500 calories. You're feeding two. You guys like that picture? Okay. Um, the other thing that's important with a breastfeeding mom especially is for her to continue taking those prenatal vitamins because she needs, she needs the extra... Um, vitamins for herself because the babe's going to continue to take what it wants and it's going to all go to that breast milk and so the babies take everything from us. They drain us until they're 19 years old. <laughs> but we love them anyway. So um, We've talked about immunizations. It's important that if a mom didn't have her, like, her MMR that we um, get her that MMR right away. And what's important with that um, shot birth control for at least one to three months. Yep. Um, if it's influenza season and they didn't want to get the influenza shot while they were pregnant, it's important to offer it to them postpartum. Um, same with COVID, I guess, at this point. I probably should add that to here. Um, and then the other one, Rogam. Who gets Rogam? Negative. So once, they, once they've delivered, they usually get Rogam like about 28 weeks in, in the pregnancy. And once they've delivered, if the mom is RH negative they'll test the baby's blood type. And so if baby's blood type is RH negative, then the mom does not have to get Rogam again. But if she has, like if she's A negative and she has an A positive baby, she will get another Rogam shot. And it just protects them from uh, developing antibodies for future pregnancies. Does that make sense? Okay, so RH negative mom that has an RH positive baby. That's what you need to know about Rogam. I don't care if you know that it's 72 hours postpartum. It can be administered 24 hours postpartum. But what I want you to remember about Rogam for the test is, initially we taught you that it's an RH negative mom and she gets Rogam and we just left it at that. But now that the baby's born, if the mom has an RH positive baby, then she would get Rogam. If she has an RH negative baby, she will not get a Rogam shot. So know the difference there. Okay, discharge planning from the hospital. Um, there, the new thing seems to be that a lot of people are wanting to go home at 24 hours. 
like 24 hour mark, they are hitting the road. Um, and so the important thing that we have to remember is they cannot leave a minute prior to 24 hours because the baby has to have that supplemental newborn screen drawn, which is state mandated testing. And they can't have that drawn until they're 24 hours old. So if you have a mom that's really insistent on leaving, just make sure she knows that. Um, otherwise, for vaginal delivery, I feel like most moms will stay two days, C-section sometimes three. Just kind of depends on what their insurance will pay for. And I don't, you guys don't need to know nursing diagnoses. Uh, any questions about postpartum? Do you guys want to take a five-minute break and then we'll go into the newborns? Please.